So tonight, I'm going to cram in about a week's worth of training in about 15 minutes. And as per usual, there's no disclaimer tonight. Everything we do is illegal. Probably shouldn't be done without the consultation of legal help. So please don't do it. And don't be an idiot. So uh, very quickly, if you want to know about what I do, come find me after the uh, meeting and whatnot. Uh, for my day job, I do social engineering, red teaming, pen testing, reverse engineering. Basically, I get hired to break into stuff and steal shit from people. It's a lot of fun. So, yeah. So, I'm going to get into a little bit of the, how to do that, but I'm going to cover it from both a red team and a blue team perspective tonight. So, technology has made document forgery so easy in this day and age. It is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I wish I was actually younger because it would be easier to get a fake ID in this day and age with all the technology out there. However, it also provides a big hole in our organizations and as well as our processes. Uh, tonight, we're just going to get into something with two scenarios that happen in real life. Uh, we're going to cover very quickly how this works, what you're using to exploit people at the social engineering level, and how to do some really quick, cheap, fast uh, preparation of documents with everything. So everything tonight I'll cover is free and can be obtained free and legally. So there's two scenarios we like to use when I do red teaming to get into places. I have to break into buildings to test physical security controls and policies. Two of which I like using is the bad technician. I'm a local technician coming out to repair or do something with your servers. So you got to let me into the data center and let me add all your servers. The other one is a fake auditor because no one questions an auditor showing up from the main office to do an audit. And everyone gives auditors pretty much free run of a whole entire facility. So there are two very easy things to use, mainly because we have existing processes for these and we think that they're benign. We always just assume the SLA that we have with a, a vendor or third party uh, counts that they're going to have uh, legit people with background checks that are going to show up to service uh, your equipment. You never think that the guy showing up to service your equipment as a technician is going to go into your server room and just absolutely destroy everything or exfil data. Same way with an auditor. An auditor isn't going to show up and do anything fun or exciting because auditors are usually pretty boring, pretty benign. They aren't going to rob you blind. But the most important thing that these both represent is both these targets and these scenarios validate existing processes and they show impact to a client. Breaking in for the sake of breaking in is nothing more than doing a stupid, highly expensive selfie. If you can't show the impact to the client, what's going on, it's worthless. So that's why you want to use these kinds of scenarios, and that's why document forgery is very, very easy to do and facilitate this. Uh, it only takes the average person three seconds when looking at something to deduce if it is counterfeit or legit. And that's everyone in this room. That's everyone. You look at something in three seconds or less, you know if it's a fake or real. And it's very easy to take advantage of that. We'll cover that very quickly. Uh, this exploits the five main points uh, that we're going to use for exploitation, which are very, very easy, and it also tests. Uh, those are fear, uh, compliance, helpfulness, apathy, and trust. Uh, fear comes from authority, so you can pull the authority card, like say Bob is your CEO. Bob calls in to have his password reset. If you don't do it, it's the CEO. You're going to get fired, whatever. You pull that authority and you use fear. The other thing you can utilize is compliance. So putting stuff in an uh, auditing language or phrasing things as an audit, it's kind of hard to argue against. You can also play off of helpfulness because people love to help you. Uh, to facilitate this is really easy. Go to a pharmacy, uh, rent some crutches, and try walking up to a building, and you'll see how quickly people let you in the building without checking your badge. So people are very helpful by nature, and you can take advantage and exploit that. The other thing is apathy. You get a, a security guard that works anywhere for eight months or more. They're going to be very complacent, very apathetic. They just don't care. They're going to love you if you bring in pizza or donuts a couple times a week and just shoot the shit with them. So you got to be careful and look for your employees that have been there for a while. Look for employee burnout because that's something that can be taken advantage of, especially with security guards if you're trying to break in. If you have an apathetic guard, they're not going to look at paperwork or other details as much. They're just going to see if there's a logo and a piece of paper and a signature. It's good to go. And trust, it's so easy to violate trust because we have an implicit trust model in the workplace of how th certain things are to work and how certain expectations are that help us facilitate uh, business on a day-to-day -day basis. We can take advantage of that, such as we send in an auditor. We already have a process for uh, audits internally 
who's going to question the auditor coming in and rifling through medical records? Uh, tools to facilitate these attacks, like I said, are free. Uh, Google image search uh, it allows you to reverse image search images. Same way with Tenai. Why this is important is it allows us to find, say, a target's logo of a company. We put that company logo in Tenai or Google image search. Not only do we see other instances where it may occur, such as websites we might want to attack, but we see relationships. And those relationships are very important. As the target attack uh, showed us, target wasn't directly attacked. It was a third party that was attacked and then pivoted in. So with these uh, Google Image and Tenai, you can find relational candidates that you could attack instead, such as third parties. Uh, Microsoft Office templates are awesome because they're free. And they're pretty much pre-made documents that you slap in a couple lines and you're ready to go. Nine times out of 10, when you're forging documents using stuff from Microsoft Office templates website, you may actually encounter someone using that actual document template within their enterprise or business. So that's, that's that much more awesome bonus for you there. Uh, another thing that is more powerful and absolutely amazing, and if you do any kind of pen testing you should have, is a clipboard. It is the most powerful force in the universe. Because no one questions the guy with the clipboard walking around looking important. It's very good also that these plastic ones open up. I like them the best because they do a couple things. One, when you're stealing documents from copy centers, you steal the documents off the copiers, put them in, just walk out the door. It's very nice. No one's going to stop you. Uh, the other thing is you can fill this up with paper ahead of time. And you can play the clumsy card. So you can trip and fall, and this opens and dumps paper everywhere, and you have 52-card pickup, which allows for distraction. But at the end of the day, clipboard is the most powerful thing in the universe. And if you don't believe me, go out tomorrow at work, print a spreadsheet of worthless shit, put it on a clipboard, and walk around with a pen. And you'll get damn near anywhere, and no one will bug you all day. It's great. The other thing is Photoshop which I'll show you how to get a legitimate free copy of Photoshop to use. And I'll show you a quick trip to, uh, trick tonight on how to use Photoshop for forgery. So again, like I said, the clipboard is the most powerful force in the universe. Uh, how many of you saw the DEF CON talk on RFID badges with Josh Perriman and Eric Smith? As you saw on that talk, you can fit that card cloning equipment inside these clipboards and just walk around and clone ID badges that way too. So clipboards are awesome. Uh, Tinai, you quite literally just put the URL in for drag and drop uh, image, same way with Google. It does the reverse image search for you. Shows you where those images of logos and documents occurred. It's very helpful. Also uh, good for finding uh, logos or company identification that you can use for letterhead. Like I said, Office templates are awesome. Nine times out of ten, you're going to find someone already using that document, possibly already in the enterprise. Uh, corporate style guides are another great thing that gets overlooked. Corporate style guide is a piece of information or a document that states what a company's logo is, how it's to be used, what fonts, what colors, what slogans, what verbiage and vernacular are to be used to keep a company's brand or logo alive and maintained. The great thing about it is they're everywhere and no one realizes what's in there because you have logos, you have art files, you have identification that you need to create convincing phishing emails in the whole nine yards. Uh, KU here has a wide open one that you can view and get all sorts of information that you would need to make a phishing email or a document or anything you need that looks like it came from the actual university. A lot of places uh, will password or uh, protect these, which is greatly urged because everything you need here for a wonderful attack is right there. Um, also use these when I did the uh, cyber raid a few years ago and got into a lot of trouble here in Kansas City. I use the style guides to pull out all the sponsors' logos, including the FBI and the InfraGuard. So it's a great thing to go back to not tomorrow to your companies and look to see what they have out there. And if not, start searching online, and you're going to find more than you ever could imagine in Shodan. Because these little simple searches, and I'll post these up later tonight, too, and on the wiki, simply looking up these will return all sorts of things, uh, even internal documents that shouldn't be outside the company. So Photoshop, you can get a hold of, and I'll show you how to use for something. It's free and legit. What happened is someone screwed up royally, and about 20 people lost their jobs a few years ago at Adobe because they published Adobe uh, Photoshop uh, Creative Suite 2 open to the web with all the keys and free downloads. 
uh, they had to move forward as a company and just let it be and let everyone have it for free. All you got to do is register with an account on Adobe.com, and you get Photoshop CS or uh, Creative Suite 2, the full Creative Suite with Photoshop, Illustrator, everything in it, and it's free. Uh, it's great to use when doing document forgery, and we'll show some steps. Uh, the construction process for documents is really straightforward and really simple in this day and age. Uh, we don't have to do cut-ups or post-ups like you used to see in the movies where you would cut things out with an X-Acto knives, paste them up, take film, print the film out, document. Everything it used to take us weeks takes you about 10, 20 minutes uh, with Photoshop and a computer. Always do your research first. Do OSINT. You can never have enough OSINT. Look into what that company does, what documents they've published online, what the vernacular is internally. Because there's a unique vernacular and cadence that each of your companies uses internally, and there's different references, and you want to make sure you get those down right before you launch an attack. An example of this is some places call it a help desk, some places call it a service desk, or some places call it a consistent office environment group. So referring to something always as a help desk, and say if you're doing a document, you could get in trouble because maybe that company doesn't refer to it as a help desk. Again, doing OSINT, doing research, find as much as you can about that company before you do the attack. Target the uh, target's IDs and logos and identities. So you have things that you can use for artwork. Use a template, or if you create it from scratch, but I urge using a template because sometimes you don't have time. It's already done for you and it's easy. And then adding validation checkpoints we'll cover real quick with the document. These are things that allow you to take a bad document and get it past people because there's key things people are going to look at in those first three seconds. And if we can fool that, we can violate that trust model and force that document into their hands and force it to be validated like a buffer overflow. So the last and final step is the presentation, which a lot of people overlook. Uh, you want to make sure the document is printed correctly and printed in a format that makes sense. You wouldn't want a high quality, high gloss, full color document for an audit document. You'd want something that looked like it came off of a printer. Uh, another thing would be uh, having signatures, which I'll show you how to fake here. So the scenario that happened here is for a second year in a row, I had to break into a data center. All the staff was the same. I thought I was royally screwed. So I went out and decided, well, let's try it again. Let's try a direct approach. I'm going to go in, walk right on the data center door, knock on the door, buzz the buzzer, have them come up, let me in. And it's going to be that simple. So I created a document and faked it by collecting some information. Uh, it's been severely censored. You put the address and whatnot of the client that you're going to. You see that we're we got a Dell work order. We're going to be from Dell. We're going to be a Dell technician. And if you see this, is it's a very generic format of a document off of Microsoft Office templates. Just fill in some just random crap with my actual name, which I'll get to here shortly. All the information, very important that you have a phone number that you can validate. So give your buddy a burner phone, a Skype phone, Google phone, whatever, and have your buddy sitting behind to field any calls if you have a validation uh, issue. So that way, if someone doesn't believe that document, your uh, buddy or boss can be sitting back in a van out in the parking lot answering that number going, hell yes, let that guy in. He's an auditor. He's supposed to be there. Don't waste our time. Uh, adding just random numbers for work orders and stuff. Um, keep it simple, nothing crazy. But here we d went out and did some OSINT. We actually found server names through metadata. So the the guys and the pretext was, hey, we're going to go in. We just got to check the track status on two Dell servers. Here's their names, which are names are if they were actually real or on the network or not. We didn't care. It was enough to get them to validate it. The next thing I did is had my handy-bandy notebook, and then... As many of you may not know, I got a new job at Dell. So I showed up first day on the job to check out those drafts. Um, it went a little too well. I was scared shitless because the guy who let me in was the same guy last year who let me in. I thought for certain I was fucked, and it was a joke. And as soon as I got into the data center, Ashton Kirchner was going to jump out with the camera crew. But it worked well. He signed it, printed it, dated it, even gave me his personal phone number on it. 
he then guided me out to the floor of the server farm and managed to find the two servers in question, pulled them out of the rack, took pictures, and took the serial numbers down, and thanked him, and went about my way. How this worked is because there was going to be no way into the data center except for a front approach. This tests the policies and procedures that you already have in place for a technician or a third party. You assume with that third party vendor agreement that you do every year, or once in a lifetime that you do, will cover you on everything. And that's something you need to look at closer is, what are these third party vendor guys coming into my enterprise doing? And how do I validate that? Because just with a simple piece of paper I printed at the hotel business center, and a t-shirt from a thrift store, and a, a notebook, or a notepad, I walked right into a data center, pulled servers off the floor, got numbers, had my hands on everything you never wanted me to have. And it was all because of a piece of paper. So you saw earlier, I put my real name on that document. And there's a reason for this when you do pen testing or social engineering or red teaming. You want your name that you give out to match that ID, which is government issued to you, in your pocket. Because if things go sour and the police show up or something else happens, they're going to ask you, why is your name Bob Smith when it's actually Trent? And that starts a whole other problem down the road, especially here in the US with some of the legal rights of police stopping you with IDs. Also, if you're overseas, you can get in a lot of trouble by not having the name that matches your ID and your passport. So always use your real name when you do some of these things. It's also easier to keep things straight in your head so you won't forget your name. So you won't be Sancho or whatever. You're going to use your real name. You can keep it in your head. You can keep everything in track. So that's why we always do that. As dumb as it sounds and looks, if you get caught by the cops or something goes south or the Chinese government gets a hold of you, it's a better day if your ID matches everything that's in your story. So another reason to use document forgery is at work, went to Madrid. At Madrid, it was supposed to break into a financial institution housed in a building. No one told us in this building. There were three countries' consulates and embassies in this building with their private security firms. The building also had its own private security force, which I did through recon of jogging behind the building one night, discovered the nice men with machine guns. So this building, we weren't getting in, we weren't repelling, we weren't doing any crazy shit. If we did, we were going to get caught, shot, or start an international incident. So we decided to go the social engineering route direct through. So we got ourselves invited to a restaurant on the 33rd floor of this building, which we had no right being ever in our lifetime. And we did that to see what the process was to get in the building. That confirmed it even worse. We had to go through scanners. We went through a metal detector. We then went through a pat down and into a check-in area with turnstiles. We waited there, and an escort would escort you. Two escorts per every person. Both escorts had machine pistols. They walked us all the way up to the restaurant and sat us in our chairs. If we needed to go to the restroom, they would escort us there. So we realized the severity of the situation was even further, and I was there with my coworker, Ryan Jones, and he turned seven shades of white as soon as we left that building, because we knew we are going to get shot tomorrow morning. So we decided, what could we do to get through all this? Paperwork. We're going to come in as auditors, because who's going to suspect auditors? And by the way, my Spanish sucked. So. We rolled in with an auditor pretext, and here's kind of a censored version, but you kind of see this document is a primary document. It's very short, very sweet, very simple. It tells you exactly what the fuck's going on right now in under three to five seconds. You look at it, you go, oh, audit. I don't know what the hell a SASAA audit is, but it sounds official, sounds legit. Everything checks out. You have call back and verification numbers, a 24-hour contact number. So if you have any questions or doubts, I already addressed them with a phone number for a 24-hour contact number that my buddy in the parking lot sitting in the van has. So that's another validation mechanism, but you keep it very, very short and simple. Now, this worked very well because we also had a signature at the bottom, which I'll show you here shortly. But the other thing is, is we used a bunch of documents we found in the hotel business center. We dug out of the trash, and we dug out several other documents and just printed random inventory sheets off of office documents. 
uh, templates. So that way we had stacks of paper. Why that was important is when those escorts were escorting us to the guard station to get our ID badges, I did the most spectacular trip over my feet, 52 card pickup, sheets of paper flying everywhere, fall flat on my face, bloody nose, stumbling around, dumb American, that when I dumped all that paperwork on the, the guard station to get going, it frazzled her so much that she just said, fuck it, here's a visitor badge, get the hell out of here. I, I don't, you're an idiot. I see the logo of the client on this paperwork, just get the hell out of here. So what really sells a lot of things is signatures on documents and how these are really easy to fake and forge is do not do it yourself. Have someone else outside of the engagement do the signature for you. Take a picture of it on a piece of paper. And we'll tempt the demo gods here. So using Photoshop, you can get it free, the CS2. Take that image, pull it in. You can see right now we have some of the artifacts from the paper. If we go ahead and print this, we'll get all these artifacts and all these kind of soft, rough edges. We don't want it will look with clipping around the uh, area that we cut out. We'll have clipping. And you can see that you pasted it in from somewhere else. To get around this real easily and quickly, we simply go to Adjustments menu. And we're going to go to Threshold. And what Threshold does is allows us to adjust the absolution of light and dark. What it does is allows us to drop absolutes and have more of a solid basic outline or shape, which in this case is just black and white, which is great. So we usually you can accept whatever comes up as a default. And as you can see it now, it's taken the background and made it all even. It's kept everything sharp and crisp and black. You can copy this in now and paste it into Word or save it as a picture and paste it into whatever document layout system you're using. And it's going to look like it was part of the original document, if not signed and sent via fax or email or scanned PDF. And that way you can do this in just a couple seconds. So occasionally you're going to run across problems when you're doing testing out in the field and everything. A quick way around this to adapt is look at what you have around you. Like if you're staying at a hotel, your hotel business centers are badass because you can print ID cards, badges, pretty much anything you need to to forge anything short of a passport at a business center. It's great and usually free. Also you're going to run across information, say if you're trying to target someone uh, who's having a conference or a function in town. Find the hotel where all those people are staying at and go through the business center. You'll find everything from uh, computers still logged in to LinkedIn to uh, USB keys, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, if you can't find that and you're traveling around, uh, car rental staff is really helpful for printing stuff out because sometimes you don't want to carry all these documents with you into another country or just carry them in general to save weight. Uh, I found everyone from hotel staff to car rental staff will help you print stuff out if you ask nice enough. So. Again, covering all your bases with the document, you can forge them very quickly as simply as grabbing a template and then throwing a picture onto something, a company logo. But you want to make sure you've got some things to cover your bases, uh, such as a callback number. Put a callback number, give it to your friend, get the phone ready so if someone has a doubt about that document, they can call that person immediately and your buddy fills in and you have a two-pronged social engineering attack. Uh, when in doubt, print everything in black and white. So that way it looks like it came out of a business and it looks like it came out of a copy room from that business. Nothing fancy. When in doubt, also use signatures as much as possible. Signatures are a thing that we have too much trust in and we use as a validation mechanism. But if we see something signed, it must be legit, it must be official and okay to go through. And again, OSINT, OSINT, OSINT. You can never have too much OSINT. Do your research, that way your paperwork and your documentation looks like the targets it's intended to do. So it's very easy to prevent these kinds of attacks, and it's also a very good mechanism to use to test your company internally. The only way to prevent this 100% effectively is through education. 
educate your staff and employees what documents look like, what validation mechanisms and processes you have behind them, and how they're supposed to operate and work. Also, all policies and procedures should be accessible to all your employees so that if there's any uh, a question, they can check to see if, should this guy have this piece of paper, should he be going into the server room with it? Uh, implementing validation mechanisms are great if you're doing like help desk phone calls. Use the mechanism of a callback to verify that the caller is in the GAL or the Outlook address book and is an actual employee. On the other hand, something that every business fails to do in America is implement an escape plan for employees. And this is how most American companies fail in social engineering, is they don't have an escape plan for an employee to enact when they're faced with a tough situation. In the case of using authority to press an employee for credentials, say in the uh, case of a password reset, the employee needs some way of backing out if that person is of a higher rank and pressures them and they don't think it checks out. They need a mechanism in which they can pull out of that situation safely and bring in extra help. You don't have that in any of our workplaces and it's really bad because it puts people on the spot and perpetuates the life cycle of social engineering. You need to give employees a way of safely backing out of the situation or implementing another control mechanism so they don't feel pressured or any kind of anxiety in dealing with the situation. Employees should have the same amount of uh, respect and no fear of anyone from the CEO on down. So that way if someone is forced with a social engineering uh, scenario, they can't pull the authority tag and force someone to a situation. You've got to back out. Also, annual testing. If you guys don't test with this with outside groups, I highly urge you every year internally or quarterly to test. If you have new policies and procedures, see if there's holes in them. See if the new uh, documents documenting how the guards are supposed to deal with people with uh, turnstiles and ID badges at the front actually matches up with what goes on, rather than the guards just kind of letting some people through in the morning and sitting in their chairs the rest of the day. Always test, see if anything opens up new holes and whatnot. Again, if you guys have any questions or need anything, this is basically a, a week class I crammed into 15 minutes, so if you have any questions or anything, let me know. We actually go through forging documents of all sorts and actually targeting scenarios so you get an idea of how to uh, conduct these attacks, usually, is what this is about. So, Any questions? What? Yeah. <laughs> we'll keep that one for later. Yep. That's where I'd go with the audit route because uh, I would draft audit documentation that would state that, hey, we saw what happened at Target. We're trying to keep it low key. We don't want to alert anyone so we have falsified results at the audit. So that's why no one notified you of my presence on site. If you have any questions, here's who you're supposed to contact. It's out of your chain of command. We're keeping this very, very hush-hush. We don't want to end up in the news. And frankly, I don't want to have to write you up as the guy who prevented me from preventing the whole company from ending up in the news. It's a simple five-minute conversation here. Let me in. If not, you call my boss. It's on this piece of paper. End of story. It depends on the person. So that way, I've forced you into a corner two different ways. You can be a total dick and try to validate every single part of my story now, or you can sit there and look like a complete idiot and make a call to a guy who's going to be like, yeah, Aaron should be there. Let him on in. In fact, give him the keys to the server room. You use the processes of the company against itself. That's why you want to test internally to make sure that these processes you have in place have, like in that instance, a backdoor or a back out for an employee. So if I press you with this, you should have some sort of validation mechanism that lets you go sideways, maybe, and have your boss then be the one responsible for signing me in if you don't feel appropriate or comfortable with my presence. Say again. Very rarely, because you d in these situations, you don't want to give an opening. You don't want to give options. You want to keep things very simple. Like you saw the documentation I had, there's no frills. That's why I say use office templates. 
because then that way you're done. Download, slap a logo in it, fuck it, call it a day, you're done. But that way you have very little things that you can check against or really validate or really dig into. You're know, like, well, this looks legit. I mean, it's crappy documentation, but he uses the right words and stuff. So, yeah, signatures. Signatures are easy to fake. So I also will not give this talk again in front of Boy Scouts because I got into a lot of trouble. So. What? Uh, this year is going to be interesting. So that, uh, that client, we did three buildings and data centers in one day the first year. By 3 p.m., we were done calling them. They were kind of baffled, so they set up and said, hey, break into the server room. It's got biometrics and a one-way camera and one door. Good luck. And, well, 3.30, we call and we're like, we're done. So this year, I felt horrible, and I actually recorded the whole thing. I have an uh, uh, ID badge with a camera embedded in it. So it's microscopic and saw small. I wore that in and record the whole time of what happened, and I felt so bad because I thought this guy was punking me. Seriously, because he let me in again. He signed everything. He didn't, and he didn't even recall, didn't even remember. That goes back to the apathy. If you have employees that are facing the same thing over and over, day in, day out, they get apathetic and they get dead to what's happening. They drop their guard. You get in easier. So one of the recommendations for that guy was in the data center was we recommended air conditioning and climate control and mandatory breaks for the data center staff. So that way the staff was forced out every hour for about 10, 15 minutes. Whether they smoked or not, they got up, walked away, came back, were refreshed, forced to go to the bathroom. And putting climate control in helped them to keep everything cool so that way people wouldn't fall asleep or get tired. So again, it's addressing things at an employee level and education. I found server, server names on documents through metadata on the web. So I thought, well, if I throw out a server names, it'll help validate why I'm there because I have something that I should not as an outsider. It's plausible as a third party person that I'm going to have these. Also, by doing additional research, we found uh, purchase orders out there, so we knew that the client used Dell. And if you want a good little tip, go to your uh, uh, clothing stores or your uh, thrift stores. Wherever I travel, I go to the thrift stores and I find everything. So I have everything from uh, DHL uniforms to FedEx uniforms to uh, TSA uniforms now. But just go to uh, a thrift store and look around and find what's there. It's pretty cool. Any other questions? <laughs>